Our first presentation is from Carl Dietrich, CAD Manager at Creighton Manning Engineering. Carl's project is a $14.5 million local, locally administrative federal aid reconstruction project for the intersection of Fuller Road and Washington Avenue in the city of Albany, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, Carl Dietrich. Hi. Well, uh, what you're looking at right there is um, a gigantic school of nanoscale science. And uh, this, is, this whole project right here is kind of driving what we had to do here. This is our road. Uh, I'll do a quick intro on my, myself and my company, uh, Creighton Manning Engineering. Uh, we're based out of Albany, New York. Uh, we've been in business for roughly 50 years. Um, we have 70 employees now, 55 full-time. Uh, in 2009, we were the proud recipient of uh, the BE Award, so we're back again to give it another shot. Uh, that project consisted of four roundabouts, and we did some pretty innovative things on that, and we took those lessons and moved forward to the next project. Uh, project goals, uh, we, we wanted to have a specific inroads approach uh, when we designed uh, the project. We wanted to use V8i. We specifically went to Philadelphia with a colleague and myself to uh, a Bentley conference, and we split up and took specific design uh, classes so we could achieve our goals on this particular project. We wanted to do our first 3D solids bridge. We wanted to leverage the 3D, the 3D data throughout the life cycle of the project. We wanted to be able to check the 3D data against vertical clearances, utilities, etc. And we wanted to make a really good visualization. Finally, the 3D data out to construction through automated grading and inspection. And lastly, which we're doing right now, we're, we're creating real 3D as-built data. Here's an overview of the project. Um, we actually uh, we got the green lights, evergreen, for transportation through New York's DOT for a sustainability project, which is a nice uh, compliment from them. Um, $14.5 million construction cost. Uh, it took us a year to design it and a year to construct it, and it actually opened yesterday fully. This is the main corridor. This is Interstate 90. This is where our project is right here. This is that school of nanoscience and engineering. And this is the land that we actually had to push the road over. And this is uh, uh, University of Albany right here. So this is a, a educational tech hub in the city of uh, Albany, New York. Our goals, I won't read them to you, but we had some specific goals. Uh, a lot of pedestrians, that's a college, so we wanted to make sure we accommodated that specifically. Uh, we had three different alternatives. You can see here, this, was, uh, this is online, not really changing anything, adding lanes. This is a heavy, heavy corridor of traffic right here, School of Science. That's just a close-up at-grade intersection. It was alternative one. And then we looked at a uh, at-grade roundabout. We did, you know, we did all, our modeling, the traffic modeling, and it, it did not work. So our final solution was a roundabout with a proposed overpass or flyover. This was a preliminary, you know, 2D presentations that we, you know, submitted to the client. This is what we ultimately designed. This was an alternative poster. You can see right here, this is the existing alignment. This is where we come off alignment. And this is where we open up all this space for this school of nanoscale science um, right in through here. Uh, alternative three, we have a bridge. It removes 20,000 vehicles a day from that intersection. So that was a big deal. That, that really helped that uh, level of service through that corridor. I'm not going to read it all to you. I don't like people that read read to me, so <laughs> this is the bridge structure, just to give you some stats on it real quick. One thing we did specifically is the pier in the middle of the roundabout, the, we wanted to leave that. We had a, a single span structure initially, but we wanted the pier to obstruct the view through a roundabout, and any, anybody's designed roundabouts, it's all about slowing traffic down, so that was part of, part of that design. Now this is the sign, this is the, uh, right here is the new nanoscale building, which is under construction here. Now my firm, we luckily got just about every aspect of this project. 
We have the civil site design. That's our civil site plan. Uh, Autodesk products there. <laughs> then this yellow here is uh, going to turn into a parking lot for that new building right there. And this is where we did the unique land swap. SUNY is uh, State University of New York, and this is New York State DOT. So we literally did a, a land swap, and it was kind of unique and tricky, politically driven. The process went pretty smooth when politics were behind us. So now here's our CAD goals. Like I said in the first thing, we wanted to utilize VEDI inroads uh, to model the roundabout completely. We wanted to produce that 3D solids model produce an excellent visualization as a byproduct of that 3D model, and take advantage of that 3D data, and then the data out to the, the contractors through automated grading. And also, we had to coordinate through our civil group, who had the other, other half of the project, and we transferred information back and forth via Land XML, and, and you know, the DWG, DGN went back and forth pretty easily. Here's the software we used, MicroStation VHI. We did use, oh, let me go back. We did use um, VDI uh, SS3 beta when we did the visualization because it wasn't fully out when we did it. We used project-wise also for, the, the, for file organization and collaborate on the team. We had the full-blown survey. Our survey crews are still out there today, um, but we, we had it flown and uh, you can see right here, we did a, a full photo, photogrammetry and then we did a total station GPS, NAT 83 coordinates. But right here is where we did our underground utility survey and all those points uh, represent the inverts in and out. And we did make a 3D surface so we could utilize that information through the life cycle of the project. Our inroads approach, this is going to get a little technical, but we, we, uh, we try to use corridor manager and we busted the, pro the project into 18 different corridors. You can see they're different color codes. The main line's orange. That would be Washington Avenue West and East, then Fuller South and North. Those are the main movements we are in green. We had to do little pieces so our surfaces would have something to hit. So that's why there's different little corridors that we had to make. When we, we started modeling this and tried to use V8I completely, we, we, that's just the approach that we had to work with. I'm sure everybody has different approaches, but that's what worked for us. We utilized a lot of inroads tools. I mean, this is get a, getting a little technical, but we use point controls, alignments, horizontal and vertical, both feature quarter points, and their end condition exceptions, target aliasing. And we had to do overlay and stripping at the end of the project where we tied into existing. This is a contract sheet. Um, but actually what this is, if you look closely, it's an inroads alignment file that the contractor is going to utilize when he's going to stake out his, uh, the project. Now this is the approach coming into the roundabout, and I'm just I'm giving you uh, some examples of some of these secondary alignments that we generated. And uh, the, the width on some of these ramps varied, so instead of making you know, multiple templates, we, used, uh, we took full advantage of the inroads tools. And that's just shown, uh, il illustrating those alignments. This is a point control secondary alignment right there. FG, finish grade, that's what it stands for. Ramp C, pavement edge left. And all these, you got to keep really good track of all this information because uh, they, they hit each other and they work off each other. And this is just showing you at a specific station we wanted it to do a certain thing, hit an alignment. This is showing... Um, uh, a pretty uh, fully integrated template. Now we put the we put every component in here. We put in the uh, under drain, all the subcomponents, curbs. This is the uh, retaining wall system. This is main line coming into the bridge, and these are ramps coming down. And then these are all your decisions on in inroads. Uh, if you don't seek one on two for a certain distance, then it goes to the next choice, the next choice, so on and so forth. Now what was a nice byproduct of this really good template? was we were able to display it and put it right into the contract plans. So that's le leveraging that inroads data into the contract plans. And this is just an example of forcing a side slope to a site grade uh, using the uh, inroads tools. Uh, <coughs> that surface right there is that civil 3D surface we had to get from our civil site guys and we had to have a specific slope coming off that ramp. 
is just showing you uh, how our, our approach on that. And this is just showing you uh, the inroads tools and how we took advantage of those secondary alignments. Uh, to me, this is the coolest slide ever because you can walk your way through your project and see how your, your alignments are working. The brown lines represent those alignments I showed you in that initial alignment file. And it's just another slide in a different position. And you can, you can walk your way through. You can see we're coming right into that roundabout there. And it's, to me, this is fantastic. You, you can see where your cuts and fills are and where you're interacting with existing. And of course, that's exaggerated vertically. And this was that quarter, that the colored quarter I showed you, the green. We stopped our bridge specifically, well, we stopped the quarters specifically at the bridge. Again, an M bridge. So that was just the logical spot to stop it. And this is that fuller washing. And that's the result of uh, all those um, quarters coming together. And this is a, another byproduct of uh, making those templates up front and doing a really good job doing your due diligence to make sure you include everything. And you've got a really rock solid cross section you can give to the contractor. It has all the, you know, your complete design intent. Now, we, we, our goal was to make the bridge in 3D. My first instinct was to just run some templates and inroads. So this was our, our quick template that we came up with. And this is the approach with the retaining wall. And you know, that's our result. It, it looks pretty good. You know, we could render that out if we wanted to. But our goal was to take the 3D data and, and make, cut our details from it in the plans. If you zoom in, it's line strings. You know, so we didn't maybe close, the, close them good enough. And then switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about drainage just real quick. Um, the benefit uh, to a 3D model is we can, you got to be able to check your drainage. One of my favorite old commands is a trickle command. You can place your cursor and see right where your water's flowing. And uh, the, the managers like to see that. They don't want to see ponding anywhere. So they always show me where the water's going. And then this is uh, a 3D rendering or a wireframe, really. And we wanted to display our, all our storm um, pipes. And then these are actually uh, fiber optic, water lines. And that's all a result of that survey 3D data that we collected early on in the process. And then this is just a byproduct of that. This is just a grading plan, a real 3D grading plan, not something some you know, CAD guy fudged. And then this is where we, got, we get into the 3D model of the bridge. We quickly discovered that uh, you got to do everything in 3D. You can't. There's no fudging it if you want to extract out your details. And uh, I'll show you what I mean next slide. This is uh, the two abutments. We're right in the middle of the roundabout, and um, it's super important to organize your 3D data. And everything is on a specific layer. And when you get into trying to utilize this 3D data in your your contract sheets, that's when it becomes critical. Because you got to turn layers on and off. And this is a cool little uh, detail here. Uh, we inscribed the city of Albany in the parapet of the bridge. Actually, city of Albany is, was former New Amsterdam. The Dutch settled it. And that's a cool fact. The, this is just showing really solid. This is a, pier, a cap. It's all details. <laughs> we put in every, we, we detail everything except for the steel bearings. That's the only thing we did not detail. And then this is just showing you um, our approach and how we cut mo details out of the model. We'd, uh, we'd make a specific mo a drawing sheet, and then we'd have a 3D model, and we'd use some clip volumes. Uh, That's just showing you uh, how you know a specific spot I need to cut. I need to make a detail right there. We're, we're using uh, view attributes where we control front and view. This is that same cut looking straight down. See, that's where that's I wanted a section right there. That's where I had to show that in my construction documents. There's the clip volume tool. That's just one way to get a, a, a section. Here's an isometric. You can see I'm controlling how far deep I want that to cut. I've got an isometric view in here and here. And to, to be honest with you, we had, this was our first go at this, so we were kind of learning as we go. And then there's a specific cut that I need. I need an abutment, and you can see the purple line. 
That's just the, the side view. And here it, here it is all coming together. I'm, I'm developing models within this contract sheet right here. You can see here's the drawing, and these are the models, and they're referenced into itself. So that's the 2D drawing sheet where I have everything dimensioned out, and these are the specific cuts. And we struggled a little bit with how to control the depth and hidden lines, and uh, that comes with some experience, and the more you get into it, the, the more obvious it becomes. And here's the contract sheet. Here's uh, all those details. They're all referenced in, logical names. Um, the one thing we took advantage of is we took advantage of associative dimensioning. So when 3D solids model adjusted, so did all our dimensions. So that, that was a huge benefit. This is a slice uh, during construction staging. And I had to show all the utilities. Uh, this is an actual 3D cut right here. And then this was just a profile I cut in inroads to get the features to show up. And then I just transposed those right in there so we could make sure we wouldn't have any construction conflicts with existing utilities. This is just showing a way you can flip views and get different views to show up. Now this is a, this is a, a detail sheet that's showing um, kind of a cool feature that we added to the project that actually got cut. Um, these are pine trees. Uh, the, the project's in a sensitive area, and it's known as the pine bush. So we were going to add these to the retaining walls to create some aesthetics. And uh, at the last minute, they, they pulled the plug on us there. But we did keep that Albany uh, engraved in the parapet. All the sections are cut from a 3D model, and then they're in their own model, referenced into the sheet via live nesting. This drawing is a 1 8th. We took advantage of annotation scale, and we took advantage of associated dimension. You can see this just slide showing uh, there's a scale, annotation scale, dim style, associative dimensions turned on. And uh, these are all, that's all 3D right there. Cuts in specific spots, that cuts there. Now here's a cool thing. We, we, like I said, we use associative dimensioning. So if any part of our model updated, we knew that our drawings were going to update too. That, to me, that's huge. That was one of the biggest benefits of the 3D model for us. Now here's, a, here's where you, you click on association. But here's an example of uh, sometimes the dimensions don't stay associative if lines get deleted. If you stretch something, the dimensions will go with it. So when you're flipping through your drawings or you plot them, you'll get a broken dimension prompting you that that dimension is no longer valid. We also looked at a, a cool tool called Dynamic view, Views late, late in the process. And uh, this is just a really slick uh, way of cutting uh, sections. That's, these are the sections I, I cut. That's actually a construction picture I popped in there. One thing we did in the project is we tried to eliminate paper and unnecessary contract sheets and uh, unnecessary information. So you can see this, this is uh, one of the contract drawings. We left out dimensions on purpose because we were going to give the 3D data and the alignment stuff. These were curb island spiller islands on another project we did for another roundabout. We didn't even include these in this project. We're giving them the 3D data. We're giving them the alignment files, vertical and horizontal. That's all they need. Contra this is a general plan. Typically, over dimension, the contractor can barely tell what he's even looking at. We, we deliberately left dimensions out. Now here's, here's where it gets fun. You got this fantastic 3D model. You can see this is a wireframe. Oh, go back one. And if you have all your information correct and you've thought about it ahead of time, you have your templates organized, you'll yield specific colors and layers in your wireframe. Now what that does is that gives you the ability to assign materials. And, uh, this is just me assigning a uh, Luxology, asphalt, and it is fairly simple. Um, I took a specific class from Mike Flynn in Philadelphia, and I, I really hadn't done one of these this to this level. After I was trained, it was pretty straightforward. And you can see pretty good result. I, I don't have the lighting quite down yet, but I'm you know getting there. I found some 3D trees, and you know we got real cars. These cars can move. Uh, animation. 
here's our 2D stripe file. We utilized um, in uh, the V8i SS3 uh, a cool thing called stencil. We were able to take this 2D striping file that we had developed and stencil it onto the 3D. Before, it was pretty tricky to get your striping on there. And then one thing we did, we wanted to have a bigger view of the project. You can see there's the new building. We uh, actually, they popped that bridge in there to connect the two because uh, this road was still open to traffic, ultimately going to be a parking lot. But what I did here is I got um, digital elevation model, spliced it into my survey, which is, you know, the approximate boundaries here. And I had this nice expanded view. We uh, gave that to the press. Here's another view. Uh, president of the company said, can you pop a drawing on here? I'm like, sure. I, I didn't really know, but we used the photo match tool and found uh, a bunch of points in 3D, in horizontal, that we found in the picture. Used the photo match tool, matched it up. You can see I'm matching it up there, there. The red lines uh, give me this rubber band thing where I can match. And voila, I got a pretty slick presentation on a 2D picture. And we had to, we had to Photoshop uh, that spire in there because obviously the CAD data goes over top. Uh, President Obama visited the site. This is an extremely high profile project. Uh, it's, the building is $300 million project. And it's a school of nanoscience and there's some um, nano chips. That's our governor. And um, at this presentation, he had my, uh, my 3D viz that I developed on a poster. And this is our local news. There's my 3D viz on TV. And that's our local newspaper. So you can see those are byproducts of that 3D data. And I'm running low on time, but the 3D data goes out to the contractor ultimately. And this is where you get your savings uh, in construction. There's some stakeless grading going on right there. Uh, the contractor requested bottom of subgrade via land XML. They're going to put it into their GIS or um, automated grading systems. This is just showing you, uh, you know, a quick uh, how we did it. This is our as-built data. We have a survey crew out there. Um, they're probably out there today. You can see all these points represent proposed finished product. And we're going to leverage this data somehow. We're not sure. Maybe GIS. And I'm um, just about done. I'm just going to pop through my slides, construction sites. I'm, I'm just about there. They're cool. So they're cool pictures. Laying the steel. So the stage, stage construction. There's the building. There's our roundabout. That's the roundabout, just about open. And this is that Albany reveal. You can see the, the letters A. I wasn't sure how they were going to make that action. A few more slides, I promise. That's the done. That's just about done right there. Uh, Questions? Uh, Rachel has a mic, so if you have a question, right? I'm just curious uh, how precise. Uh, were your measurements when you were uh, out there taking data and if that uh, relates to the uh, Bentley's new agreement with uh, Trimble? Uh, uh, I'll, I'm not, I'm the CAD manager, but we definitely had a survey crew out there and our, our inspectors. <laughs> you know, there was a total station on site, so the level of accuracy I'm not 100% um, aware of. But we did, we got it built. Yeah. Uh, Anthony Oliver from New Civil Engineer magazine in the UK. Um, you talked about having re <coughs> real 3D as built. Um, can you give us a, a bit of a steer about what's going to happen to all that information well, now? Has, has it been passed over as 3D models? Of what well, that's, that's where we're, get, we're hoping to leverage that information. This is, this is a, as you can see from the, the slides before, it's a really busy utility corridor. And that information I think is going to be critical later. If there's any new additions, there's going to be another building put next to that building, and they're going to want to know where everything is in 3D. And we, we, our surveyors went out and they specifically hit shots, and they coded it so we can isolate data. And I'm assuming we'll shoot it out to GIS, hopefully, and um, make surfaces out of stuff. We're not sure yet. You know, we're, we're, you could see we had a lot of data there. 
but we know we have data that's important. Uh, question. Sure. Um, great job on the 3D model. Have you considered using what you created? I mean, you have the final design there, but to do the construction staging? I mean, maybe it wasn't uh, so critical to have that now, but I think it's an excellent tool that you could have I'm assuming oh, you could have taken that uh, model and showed the sequence actually, of construction. Yeah, well, we had a, dis a dispute over um, earthwork quantities, and that that one slot I, I kind of clicked short, but it actually showed uh, the proposed or the actual surface versus our proposed surface, and then what the contractor thought he should be paid for the earthwork, and we, without a shadow of a doubt, proved that he was, you know, being unreasonable. So that was just an example of how we leveraged that data. Um, we didn't really, we didn't do it through st the, like the stage construction, though, to answer your question. Uh, Jeff Thurston, 3D Visualization World. Um, my question for you is, is this your first project on 3D, or were you working in that medium previous to this project? We, like I said, we won a BE award. Um, in 2009, and it was all in 3D. I, I, I modeled every single thing in 3D using inroads. Um, our bridge group is relatively young to the firm, and we've done a lot of bridges. We played around with 3D, but we never made a 3D solids where we were going to extract that information and turn it into contract plans, the details specifically. I would say 80% of the details for the project were cut from that 3D model specifically, and then there was 2D, you know, standard details. So you would be working in 3D from now on, do you think? Like you, you know, sound very comfortable with it. It, it. We're working on a box culvert right now for a small municipality, and no, we're not doing that in 3D. It's, we've got standard details we're popping in, but a large project, without a shadow of a doubt, it's, you could see the benefit. I mean, we had a nice byproduct, the 3D viz, and then the ability to cut sections anywhere you wanted and uh, have the dimensions all update automatically. It's fantastic. Uh, Mike Wolf, World Highways. Just want to check the, the contractor. Is this one you've worked with before? And uh, also, were they using, um, you, you said the system was stateless. Were they using uh, your 3D model for their machine control as well? Yes, they were. What, what, what we ended up doing was we had to dumb down the data. Uh, we, we they wanted bottom-up subgrade. That seemed like the, what the contractor wanted the most because they're using the bulldozers. So we, we translated those out via Land XML, and then they, I think they reduced the data even more when they're using, you know, their Trimble or the whatever units they have on their automated grading. The contractor we hadn't worked with before, so we weren't sure how tech-savvy they really were. But uh, I'll tell you what, we didn't have too many issues out in the field. I was, it went really well. Last, last question. Uh, yeah, my question concerns how, if you know, uh, was the inspection and 3D as built that you were talking about, how were they actually collected? Were they done by the state, or did you all go back out afterwards no. and redo it, or how was that handled? Actually, we, my firm got the inspection contract, too. And our inspectors, we had a full survey crew, and uh, they inspected everything. Um, so you basically surveyed behind yeah. the contract. Yeah, GPS. <laughs> yep. Thank you very much, Carl. All right, thank you.